Well, good morning. It's a joy to be in God's house this morning. Amen? Amen. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 1. And as you're turning there, just as a, a brief recap, this is the fourth sermon that we've spent in a passage that began in verse 12 of this chapter. And it's talking about Paul's indestructible joy. And just so you'll be up to speed, we left off with verse 21 last week. And what we've seen is that circumstances couldn't steal Paul's joy. People couldn't steal Paul's joy. Death couldn't even steal Paul's joy. But I'm excited about what's in the verses we're going to look at today. Verses 22 through 26, we're going to see that there was an important ingredient involved in this unshakable joy, in this indestructible joy. And so I want to invite you to stand to honor the reading of God's Word with me. I'm going to begin reading in verse 19 and read all the way through verse 26. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean more fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Father, as we have the privilege of uh, feasting upon your holy word today, I pray, Lord, that you will impact our hearts through the work of your Holy Spirit, that you will give us that ingredient that is necessary to have unshakable joy especially during this Christmas season. We ask all this through the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Now I believe if, if we were to go back and look at verses 12 through 26, and we saw the different elements of joy, beginning in verse 12, circumstances cannot steal my joy. They're actually working for the furtherance of the gospel. And then continuing around verse 15, people can't steal my joy whether they're outside the church or inside the church because the Apostle Paul was receiving persecution from unbelievers. He was receiving persecution from believers and his joy was unshakable. And then we saw in verses 19 through 21 that death couldn't even steal his joy. That he, he had determined in his heart that whether I am alive or whether I die, it will be for the glory of Christ no matter what happens to me. And then we get to a dilemma that he has. But before I mention that dilemma that, that Paul has in his, in his spirit or in his, in his thoughts, I want to say that I think that you can sum this entire passage up, the entire passage on indestructible joy, from verse 12 all the way to verse 26, by the phrase that Paul used in verse 21. Look at verse 21 for a moment. He says in verse 21, basically that he has decided, for to me, to live is Christ. Now if I die, that's going to be gain for me, but I want to particularly look at that first phrase this morning, the phrase, to live is Christ. We learned last week that, that the original translation of that phrase doesn't have the word is in it. And so it literally reads, to live Christ and to die gain. It's the very essence of why we live. It's the very essence of when we die. To live Christ. It's not a result, it's a, a means. It's the primary focus. To live Christ, to die gain. But I want us to look at that phrase, to live is Christ today. Because I feel like if Paul had to sum up his joy and how he was able to maintain this joy into one phrase, that's what he would tell us, to live as Christ. What does that really mean, though? What does it look like in someone's life, certainly in the life of Paul, 
to live is Christ. And we're going to see that. That's much of what we're going to speak of today. How was Paul able to have indestructible joy? How did his joy surpass his circumstances? The answer to that is found in to live is Christ. And, and I was studying in the Psalms as I do every week because on Wednesday nights uh, the adult Bible study were working through the Psalms and using them as prayers that we can offer up to the Lord. And we, we studied this past Wednesday night, and I see it a lot in the Psalms, especially in King David and the songs that he wrote to the Lord, where he is having to coach himself to glorify God. And, and you say, what do you mean? You, he was a, a man of God. Yes, but even this man whose heart was seeking after God, he had to coach himself. And the way that looked in the Psalms, often as he would, he would refer to himself, he would say, soul... And then after he got his own attention, he would say, glorify Christ in your body, or glorify God in your body. Soul, why are you disquieted within me? Why do you fear? You need to glorify God. And he was having to tell himself to do this, and we have to do that today. And so to live as Christ is you determining today that you're going to glorify Him in everything that you do. What does that mean? That means that before it ever happens... Today, whatever hand I am dealt, I'm going to glorify Christ with it. I don't have to know what it is. I don't have to know how it's going to turn out. I'm going to decide right now, before it happens, that I will glorify Christ with what comes my way today. And that's what it means to live is Christ. No matter what happens to me today, Christ will be glorified. And that's a determination that if you don't have that made up in your mind and in your heart, it's not going to just happen by coincidence. It's something you have to, to fight for. It's something you have to strive for. Now, I will say, he's going to see to it in the end that he is glorified, whether it's through your obedience or disobedience. He will be glorified ultimately, but we have to make a determination each and every day of our lives, we will glorify Christ today. And, and that is what's going to affect my thoughts, it's going to affect my actions, and my interactions with others. You have to declare it, and you have to fight for it. So verse 21, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Then we get to the dilemma that I mentioned earlier. And this dilemma is Paul thinking in his heart, I would really like to be up there where you are. But I understand that's not what's best for the people at Philippi. That's not what's best for the church right now because you're not finished with me yet. And so let's read verses 22 through 26. And I uh, prayerfully you'll see that there is one element, one ingredient that needs to be present in our hearts in order for us to have this indestructible joy and to live as Christ. It says, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. I want to tell you a little story about someone that I think this example of the Apostle Paul was lived out in, in a beautiful way. Uh, many of you may have heard of the name Adoniram Judson. I I'll tell you who Adoniram Judson was in history. He was the first recorded missionary, Christian missionary, ever to be sent out from America to another country. Adoniram Judson went first with his wife and children to India, and after staying there a short while, he then went to Burma, where he spent the next 40 years serving the Lord. After 14 years in Burma, he had a handful of converts, that was all, and had managed to write a Burmese grammar. During that time, he suffered a horrible imprisonment for a year and a half, and during his imprisonment, he lost his wife and children to disease. Like Paul, 
he longed, and you can read this in his writings, he longed to, to just die and be with the Lord. He, he longed to go and be with the Lord in heaven. But also like the Apostle Paul, he considered his work for Christ to be infinitely more important than his personal longings. He therefore prayed that if God would allow him to live long enough to translate the entire Bible into Burmese, he would also like to establish a church where there was at least 100 Burmese believers attending that church. That, that's what he requested from God. I know that you're not finished with me yet, and my goal here on earth before you call me home is to translate the Bible into Burmese and to have a, a Christ-following church of at least 100 members. Well, the Lord granted that request and also allowed Adoniram Judson to compile a Burmese to English dictionary and an English to Burmese dictionary that many Christian missionaries used to their, to their advantage many years after that going to Burma. But here's what, I, I read all of that to get to this statement that is in, included in some of Judson's writings. He wrote these words, If I had not felt certain that every trial that I endured was ordered by infinite love and mercy, then I could not have survived my accumulated sufferings. I want to read that again. This is coming from a, a man who lost his wife and children to disease, who spent a year and a half in a brutal imprisonment, labored for 15 to 20 years before he really saw the work of the Lord come about in Burma and served another 20 years there. And he writes these words, If I had not felt certain that every trial that I endured was ordered by infinite love and mercy, I could not have survived my accumulated circumstances and sufferings. Ordered by infinite love and mercy. Adoniram Judson viewed everything in his life through the lenses of Jesus Christ. That's why he was able to look at these extenuated, suffering circumstances and say, to God be the glory. I read that to you today to, to put a fleshly example along with the Apostle Paul on what it really means to live as Christ. That no matter what happens to me today, Christ will be glorified by it. So to live as Christ involves total surrender. And I want to I read something to you today that, that puts it in, in some more terms for us. There is a hymn in our hymn book, uh, number 277, titled, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. And I want to read the lyrics of this hymn. Written in the 1800s, it says, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise. And then this last one really encompasses what it means to live as Christ. It says, Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. And so we have to literally, every day that we wake up, we have to make that renewed commitment. Today, I am going to live Christ. And no matter what happens to me, whether it is rejoicing or whether it is suffering, Christ will be glorified in what I do today. Indestructible joy is the result of making that commitment. It's the result of total surrender. And total surrender means to view everything that happens to you through the lenses of how it affects Christ's glory, not how it affects you. But the dilemma is still there in Paul's mind. And, and it's in that dilemma, verses 22 through 26, 
that brings us the ingredient for unshakable joy. Part of spiritual greatness is to know Christ intimately, but it goes further than that. It's to know Him so intimately that you desire more than anything else to be with Him. Whether that be physically or spiritually. And so in desiring to be with Christ, you know that the greatest fulfillment of that desire would be to die and go spend eternity in heaven. But you also know that until that happens, I'm going to have unending fellowship with him this side of heaven. And so that, that uncontrollable desire, that insatiable desire to be with Christ is going to consume me while I'm alive and is going to be rewarded when I die. And, and that's what Paul experienced here. Look at verse 22. Paul deeply longed to go and be with his Lord in heaven, but he also knew that there was still work to be done here on earth. Verse 22, But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Fruit from my labor. Paul was going to use every breathing moment to produce fruits of righteousness here on earth. And he knew that the Holy Spirit would bless those efforts of the spreading of the gospel. And I want to read several texts to you about these fruits. Uh, first one, Colossians chapter 1. Verses 5 through 6, it says, We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Where the gospel is shared, fruit will be produced. Fruitful labor is what we were created to do. Ephesians 2.10 For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. It is the result of God working in us. Philippians 2 Verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his own good pleasure. And then our fruitful labor can be divided into two categories. We have the fruits of the attitude, and we have the fruits of the action. We could call them attitudinal, attitudinal fruit and action fruit. The attitudinal fruit is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, for, for against this, against such, there is no law. And then the action fruit, Philippians 1 Verse 11 and many other verses being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Or Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. These are fruits that are seen by others, produced by the, the attitude that is glorifying to God. And then we can't talk about fruits of our labor without talking about one of the most tangible ones or or, or maybe even one of the most important ones, and that is converts. Uh, one of the biggest fruits of your labor here on this earth are people trusting Christ as their Lord and Savior. Paul says all the time, this is one of my sons in the faith. This is one of the fruits of my labor. These are, are, are people that I've led to the Lord, and, and they are now living out the gospel. And in Romans 1.13, he speaks of that kind of fruit. He says, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you but was hindered until now, that I might have fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. His driving force uh, behind going to these different cities and planting churches and sharing the gospel was to produce the fruit of converts. Even though he was not the one to save, he knew that they can't get saved without the hearing of the gospel. And so he was consumed with taking the gospel to them. So we could ask ourselves two questions before we go to the, the next part 
of this ingredient. We know that, that part of unshakable joy or indestructible joy is wanting to be with Christ at all costs. But is my life characterized by the fruitful labor that shows I want to be with Christ? Am I using every moment to produce fruits of righteousness for the glory of Jesus Christ alone? So total surrender involves fruitful labor and a desire to be with Christ, but it also is accompanied by a supreme desire to leave this earth and go where He is. To depart and be with Christ. Verse 23 says, I am hard pressed between the two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Now why is it so important? And, and I, got, I thought this at, at the beginning of the week when I was studying this text. Why is it so important that I am consumed each and every day with wanting to go and be with Christ? Because I, I certainly don't need to wish every day that I was dead. That's kind of a morbid way to live, isn't it? But what does it do in my thinking if every day I want, I want to go to heaven and be with Him? It's going to change the way I live. It's going to change the way I approach each day. Number one, I'm going to approach it like it's my last and want to get everything done that Christ wants me to do this side of glory. Number two, I'm going to have that end goal in sight. And so whatever happens to me this side of glory, I can remain joyful because I know the best is yet to come. Because I am so focused on being with Him, I'm going to glorify Him each and every day. Instead of living with a fear of death, I live with an excited anticipation of death because I know that's where my ultimate fulfillment is going to come from. I will get to be in eternity with Christ forever. And I am reminded, as I was studying this verse, uh, verse 23, several years ago, we lost a, uh, a cherished member here in our church, Miss Pat Pitts. Many of you remember her. But something else I remember was a comment that Miss Carpenez made when she had found out that Miss Pat had died. Uh, Miss Carpenez had already been diagnosed with cancer, already been told she had less than six months, but had already lived several years and, and still alive and well today, praise God. But the comment that she made to me when I spoke with her about Miss Pat passing away, as best as I can quote, went something like this. I am jealous that my sister has beaten me to heaven to be with Jesus. But I guess that means he's not finished with me yet. That is a comment made by someone who desires to be up there where he is, but is going to do everything she can to glorify him as long as she's this side of glory. The word that Paul used for to depart in verse 23 to depart and be with Christ is far better, is the same word that is translated to unloose. And let me tell you when it was most commonly used in Paul's day. And, and this was probably the, the thought that Paul had in his mind. And I imagine this would be the same thought that Miss Kay has in her mind. It was used for the untying of a boat from its moorings when it is ready to set sail. And so think about that image with me for a moment. When the time comes that I die and pass from this life into the next, it is at that time that the moorings that have had me tied down will be loosed and I will then be ready to set sail for the rest of eternity. And that is exactly the thought that Paul was using here. Uh, another way that verb was used was in the... Uh, freeing of a prisoner from his prison bonds or, or prison bars to be loosed and set free. And Paul viewed death that way. That is when I will be released from all the pain and suffering of this world. That's when I'm going to be released from the restrictions of this earthly body and I will be able to set sail with Christ for eternity in heaven. And Paul spoke of this same concept in 2 Corinthians 5.1. And I love this mentality when it is placed upon life and death. It says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, 
we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So, so what does that mean? For the Christian, death is simply moving from your temporary dwelling place to your eternal dwelling place. And that's not something to fear. That's something to look forward to. And it happens immediately. Uh, I do want to stop for a moment before we progress to the next point and say that verse 23 is one of, of many verses in the New Testament that does away with a false teaching. And, and I've heard it called several things. I've heard it called uh, holding place. I've heard it called soul sleep. I've heard it called a, a state of unconsciousness that you dwell in after you die until Christ returns. But, but look at this verse. That is, uh, that is not found here. I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, speaking immediately, which is far better. And, and if that's not enough to see that there, how about Jesus interacting with the thief on the cross? What did he tell him? Uh, Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And how about 2 Corinthians 5, 8? We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And so we know that it's an immediate thing. So I have no fear of death is what Paul is saying. In fact, death is the passageway from my temporary dwelling place to my eternal dwelling place. But I'm going to serve him faithfully until that day comes. And, and I'm looking forward to that day. Our supreme joy is found in Christ, and our supreme fulfillment of that joy will be when we get to be with Him in glory. But there's something that we must do in the meantime, which brings us to the, the final part of this ingredient. If you want to have unshakable joy, you have to have a desire to serve Christ. You have to have a desire to be with Christ. And that desire to be with Christ needs to cause you to live in Christ. To live as Christ. Verses 24 through 26. He says, I know it's better for me to stay here for now. And so as long as he leaves me here, I'm going to make sure I'm committed to serving him. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. That your rejoicing for me may be, may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul had determined that as bad as this is right now, and, and let me remind you or maybe uh, fill you in if you haven't been with us in preceding weeks, Paul is currently under house arrest in Rome. He's got a Roman guard chained to him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This house arrest lasted two years, and he's writing these words. Now, if, if we were writing these words... I or if I, I'm not going to include you in this. If I were writing these words, they would probably sound more like this. I hope that death is right around the corner so that I can be freed from this torment that I am in. But because Paul was so set on fulfilling the Lord's will and not his own will, he writes these words instead. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And so that's what I desire. I desire for... Uh, I, I understand, and this is verse 26, I understand that there will be more glory given to Christ if I live through this and then come to you again to serve you on the other side of this persecution than if I went ahead and died in it. There will be more glory given to Christ if I survive. And so that's what I desire as well. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith so that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul had made up his mind that whether he died and went to be with Christ or whether he continued to live on this earth, he would make the most of it by glorifying Christ in everything, with every breath. I referred to 2 Corinthians 5, 8, but I think it's also important for us to read verse 9 as well. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But listen to what he said after that. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. 
I know that being absent from the body is present with the Lord, but whether I am absent or whether I'm still present, I want to please Him with everything that I do. As long as the Lord had work for Paul to do on earth, that's what he wanted to be doing. And then for us, we should live each day with that anxious anticipation of going to heaven and seeking uh, what else there is that God wants us to accomplish this side of heaven. Uh, making the most of every moment. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says that. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I want to tell you this. There's one thing you can be certain of. Uh, we, we see all the time people in the ministry retire from the ministry. And I'm not talking about just those who are in positions like mine. But people who once served the Lord that don't actively serve Him anymore, and they say, well, I've, you may hear them say, I've done my share, I've paid my dues, I've kind of retired and, and, and sunken into this comfort zone. Here's one thing you can be certain of, absolutely certain of. If you are still breathing, then there is at least one thing you have not done yet that Christ wants you to do before he calls you from this earth. Why, why can we be certain of that? Because if you've completed everything he wanted you to do, you wouldn't be here. And so there, there's no retiring from the faith. We retire from the faith when we're with him in glory. Or, or from serving in the faith when we're with him in glory. Then we worship him from then on out. But as long as we're here on this earth, we know there's at least one more act of obedience between now and us going to be with the Lord because He has chosen to leave us here to accomplish it. Serving Christ should consume every moment that God decides to delay calling us home. We try to be very intentional around Christmas time. Uh, I hear this time of year more than any other time of year, let's make it about Christ. Let's keep Christ the center of it. Well, I, I want to propose today, how about the other 364 days of the year? Shouldn't that be coming out of our mouth every morning that we wake up? Let's make everything today about Christ. Let's make Him the center of it. The center of the celebration that's going to happen over the next 24 hours. To live as Christ no matter what season it is. So, so let's... let's Consume our minds with these thoughts today. Will I glorify Christ today? Because that, that's a decision. Will I serve Him with joy today? And will I live my life in total surrender to live as Christ? Will I make the most of every passing moment for the glory of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior? When I was thinking about that in my own life and praying this week of, of do I approach each passing moment with a, a desire to be with Christ, a desire to serve Christ, I thought about Hebrews 12, 29 that says, For our God is an all-consuming fire. And then I thought, does He consume all of me? Does each passing moment reflect the fact that I am consumed by God's love and a desire to serve Him and glorify Him? And so we ask the question in our, uh, the last part of this section of serving the Lord with joy and, and looking at Paul's indestructible joy. Circumstances couldn't steal his joy. People couldn't steal his joy. Death couldn't steal his joy. And the reason is, he had this circumstance-surpassing desire to be with Christ. I want to be up there where you are. And until that happens, I'm going to be with you in spirit and serve you with every passing moment. And for that, I will be joyful because I know what the outcome is. The outcome is your glory. And whatever needs to happen to me to accomplish that, then so be it. To God be the glory. Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you this morning with many different feelings. Um, 
feelings of joy. Some of us are, are filled with feeling, feelings of sadness. Uh, maybe feelings of doubt, of fear, or of comfort and confidence. But Father, I, I request of you today that you would fill our hearts through Christ Jesus with a cons an all-consuming desire to be with your Son, Jesus. A desire that drives us to want to be with Him every moment of every day and to want to serve Him every moment of every day. Christmas is about Christ. But so is every other day that you choose to leave us here on this earth. May we make the determination every morning to glorify Christ in our bodies today. To present ourselves as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable act of worship. And Father, we thank you for the glory that you will receive from that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.